Well, friends, and of course, all my dear students and former students, um, I would like to begin by saying that, uh, as all of you know, this is one of the toughest times that JNU and perhaps the country is also going through. I was uh, rather... Uh, worried when I read a report in today's newspaper which was talking about a book release function held yesterday uh, for a book written by our former uh, Home Minister and Finance Minister Chidambaram which said that in his speech he noted that in the history of independent India there are three moments where he has seen such polarization. And he and said, the partition, partition. the Babri <laughs> Masjid demolition, demolition, and what happened what around, around it. And, and he said, said now. now. I'm beginning and with this to try and bring to you the significance of what is happening today. What is happening is not <coughs> just about JNU, as I'm sure all of you are by now aware. <coughs> It is about JNU, it is about Kanaya, it is about all our other students. It's about Anirvan, it's about Omar. And yet it's much, much bigger than that. And I think increasingly we all have to get a sense of what we are fighting for. What is it that we are standing up for and how important it is that we stand up and continue to stand for it. Because I think JNU has been chosen for this attack because precisely of its significance and the symbolism that JNU embodies. And I think the powers that be feel that if they can cow us down, if they can make us shut up, if they can scare the JNU students, then they won the battle. They don't have to go to every university and every town in the country to tell them, don't speak against us and our ideology. Don't speak against their idea of India. The message will go loud and clear. People will say, if JNU couldn't stand up to it, if JNU with its renowned faculty couldn't stand up to it, if JNU with its wonderful students couldn't stand up to it, with all the support that it can get internationally and nationally from the media, from every sector that we are getting, from parliament, if we can't stand up to it, then the battle is really won. So I think the significance of this battle for all of us, we are fighting for the nation. And we are lucky, in a way, that we are the ones who have been chosen for this. Because we do have the capacity to fight. In difficult times like this, it is privileged places like JNU. And I don't mean privileged in the ordinary sense of the term that we have more money or we have more facilities. I mean privileged because of the education that we get over here privileged because of the quality of the faculty and the students, privileged because of our tradition, which has been established by the founding uh, founders of this university, which have given us this very solid grounding. So I think it's, it is very important that we each one of us understand the significance and therefore bring to our struggle that seriousness and uh, gravitas, sobriety, and sense of purpose. I also want to use this opportunity to say that the slogans which we are putting out and the principles which we are talking about that we embody, debate, discussion, difference, we are telling the world every day 
We are not anti-national. In fact, we are nation builders. We are telling the world every day that we believe in debate and in respecting difference. We believe in discussion. We believe in actually sorting out all our problems through our own institutional mechanisms. We are fighting for our autonomy. We are criticizing those in our administration who have been compromising our autonomy. But that puts a very great responsibility on us that we do actually live these principles. We also need to look inwards. Where we have been intolerant, we need to ask ourselves, do we need to change? Do we need to become also more accommodative of difference? Do we need to engage in more debate and discussion and dialogue rather than just tolerate difference? These are some of the things I'd like to talk to you about today linking it with the tradition of the Indian national movement. As you know, I'm not, I'm not a theoretician, I'm not an ideologue, I am an ordinary uh, historian and our craft is a very mundane craft. We wade through very boring archives and we try to make sense of that and we try and bring you some of the excitement of that past. So what I'm going to do really is tell you some stories, uh, especially about those parts of our past and of the past of our long battle for freedom, which are not so well known. So I will, there may be, may be times where you feel Why do we need to go back into these old stories? Admiral Ramdas just said, we are in the 21st century, nationalism and his idea that came up in the 17th century. Forget it. It's a very nice, uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's a nice talking point, but it, it is actually too serious. Uh, nationalism and its power, we are seeing it around us. How it's being misused, how it's being flung in our face, how in less than two weeks the image of this university has been changed in the country. You all know when you go out what happens when auto drivers tell you you want to go to Pakistan. No. By the way, my answer to that is why should I want to go to Pakistan when you're making Pakistan here? <laughs> I need not go across the border very soon. But I'm, I think that we need to take uh, the idea of nationalism seriously, understand its resonance among the people, and try and appropriate to ourselves what I have called recently also, I wrote about it, uh, that there is a progressive nationalism, there is a revolutionary nationalism, and there is a regressive and a jingoistic nationalism. It's the jingoistic, aggressive nationalism which is calling us anti-nationalists. And we are going to return that. We are going to reply to that by telling people, by telling our countrymen, we stand for the humane, compassionate, pro-people, revolutionary nationalism, which our freedom struggle has given us. It's that tradition which we are going to assert and throw in the face of those who are challenging our nationalism. I'll begin, <coughs> begin by just a few general observations about the legacy of the freedom struggle. But for my talk today, I have chose to concentrate on the issue of civil liberties. Because I think the heart of the debate, or rather the attack on us today, and especially on our students, is the issue of civil liberties. How every channel, every discussion, everywhere you go, they say, but aren't there limits that have to be placed on civil liberties? Is there no restriction on freedom of speech? What are those limits? What are those restrictions? These are not absolutes. These are not things which you can answer with a yes or a no. And I think we need to look back at our own tradition and see 
how the struggle that brought this country into being how did they address these issues what was the what was the nation they envisioned and how did they see to it through their own practice and their own struggle that these ideas were embodied and went deep into indian society but just a little caveat before i get on to civil liberties which is to say that the legacy of the freedom struggle in my opinion is many fold but the crucial elements in that are a commitment to secularism a commitment to democracy and civil liberties civil liberties are part of you cannot have one without the other but i'm not going to be talking about democracy today i'll focus on civil liberties there is the tradition of an egalitarian social and economic order or a pro poor orientation and there is the tradition or the legacy of sovereignty and independence these are some of the crucial legacies that we have from our freedom struggle which are embodied in our constitution this constitution was not a gift of the british democracy was not a gift of the british we fought for it every inch of the way as early as 1895 lokmanya tilak had published a constitution of india bill in which he had asked for universal adult suffrage both men and women no property qualification no educational qualification as early as 1895 in britain women got the vote after the first world war in india of course as we know we got it in the constitution right from 1895 i mean i gave you the example of 1895 but from much before that the struggle for what finally went into the constitution of india had been going on so the constitution also was not a one shot affair in fact much of what the constitution actually was finally had been worked out through the early at least 50 in the previous 50 years before that through the, again through debate discussion struggle and long uh, deliberations between different streams of the indian national movement coming to civil liberties <coughs> i'd like to begin by saying and this this should strengthen all of us that this tradition actually goes back at least to ram mohan roy and i'm talking about 192 years ago so when you're fighting this battle for civil liberties don't feel weak it's you have that whole tradition and that whole legacy uh behind you i i don't know what's going to happen to the light but to the extent i can i do want to share some very interesting uh quotes with you This is in the year 1824 Raja Ram Mohan Roy protested against a regulation restricting freedom of the press the regulation did not come before that because there was no press so as soon as the press modern press started to emerge the regulation started to emerge he wrote in a memorandum to the supreme court every good ruler will be anxious to afford every individual the readiest means of bringing to his notice whatever may require his interference to achieve this important object the unrestricted liberty of publication please note the words the unrestricted liberty of publication is the only effectual means that can be employed so this goes back to the early 19th century even before the establishment of the indian national congress in 1885 which we usually take as the beginning of the modern uh, national movement right from the 1860s 1870s 1880s the demand for civil liberties and particularly freedom of the press was an invariant part of the demands of the early nationalists in fact i would say that indian nationalism actually began in the indian language press the earliest manifestations of indian nationalisms and the earliest manifestation of identifying with the peasant 
which becomes a very interesting and important feature of Indian nationalism, begins in the 1860s. It is Deen Bandhu, Deen Bandhu Mitra who writes Neil Darpan in the early 1860s. It's a, it's a play about the Indigo Revolt. That is as early as the 1860s, just a few years after the revolt of 1857. And beginning with that, this, this goes on strengthening to the point that in 1878, the British had to pass the Vernacular Press Act. Why did they pass a Vernacular Press Act? To restrict the freedom of the Indian language press, not the English language press. Because the Indian language press was far more radical and revolutionary than the English language press. So they brought in a bill they passed the act which severely restricted the liberty of the Indian language press. And I'll come back in a, uh, no. Uh, and there was a huge agitation by nationalists uh, and the nationalist press against this act. I'll come back to this story a little later. All early nationalist leaders made maintenance of civil liberties and their extension an integral part of the national movement. They fought against every infringement of the freedom of the press and speech and opposed every attempt to curtail them. I will try and give you a few examples. In fact, it was said at that time that the press played the role of the institutional opposition to the government. In the absence of democracy, it was the Indian press which fought for its freedom every day, which performed this task. The motto of the press was, was called, I quote, three words, oppose, oppose, oppose. And please remember, I'm talking before even the establishment of the Indian National Congress. Every act of the government was subjected to sharp criticism. Lord Dufferin, who was the Viceroy, in March 1886, barely three months after the formation of the Indian National Congress said, and I quote, day after day, hundreds of sharp-witted babus pour forth their indignation against their English oppressors in very pungent and effective diatribe. Will anybody say that of our press today? He continued two months later, I quote again, in this way there can be no doubt that there is generated in the minds of those who read these papers a sincere conviction that we are all of us the enemies of mankind in general and of India in particular. That was the tone of the press even before, officially, the organization that led the Indian national movement was founded. However, as we all know now, very uh, shows you the long path the national movement had crossed in this period and how Gandhian politics brought a completely new uh, idiom, not just idiom, it brought a completely new framework into Indian nationalism. Even the great Tilak, courageous, brave, not afraid of the British, willing to go to jail, defended himself against the charge of sedition. Gandhiji said, I plead guilty to the charge of sedition. This was the territory that the movement had crossed till then because Gandhiji said, yes, indeed, this is a satanic government and I am proud to oppose it. So they did not resist. These became acts of civil disobedience, where you proudly and openly defied laws that you thought were unjust and took the punishment for them. Coming to Gandhiji, I would like to share with you a couple of, I think, very fine quotations. As we all know that in his work and in his uh, actual practice in the freedom struggle, Gandhiji showed a tremendous commitment 
to the values of democracy, civil liberties, dialogue, including dialogue with his opponents. His whole ethic of politics was that you do not even leave your opponent out of a dialogue. But <clears throat> still I think it's important that we also get a flavor of the beautiful language in which he could express his ideas. I'm quoting from a statement, uh, an article he wrote in Young India in 1922, in January at the height of the non-cooperation movement. Even at the height of the non-cooperation movement, he's telling people the most important thing is to civil liberties. I quote, we must first make good the right of free speech and free association before we can make any further progress towards our goal. We must defend these elementary rights with our lives. That's how important the struggle for civil liberties is, that you must be willing to even sacrifice your life for it. I quote from another article which he wrote soon after, Liberty of speech means that it is unassailed even when the speech hurts. Liberty of the press can be said to be truly respected only when the press can comment in the severest terms upon and even misrepresent matters. Freedom of association is truly respected when assemblies of people can discuss even revolutionary projects. The only line that he drew was that of nonviolence, as will become clear in the next quotation that I read to you. I quote again, civil liberty consistent with the observance of nonviolence is the first step towards Swaraj. It is the breadth of political and social life. It is the foundation of freedom. There is no room here for dilution or compromise. It is the water of life. So civil liberties, there are no limits. There is, it's the water of life, he says. The, Im the imagery of water, I think, is very significant. Water of life, that is, there is no life without water. And civil liberty is like water. But it also can't be diluted. You can't say, I give you this freedom, but I put restraints on it. But I put limits on it. In fact, the Supreme Court also, in the way it has defined Section 1, uh, 24A and what constitutes it has very clearly put in non-violence or violence that is as long as you remain within those limits you cannot be accused of sedition even if you are discussing a revolutionary project. So I think this is something that becomes very clear from what is the understanding of the notion any notion of limits. Nehru was, Jawaharlal Nehru was perhaps the most vociferous believer of civil liberty, in civil liberties. I quote from him, this is 1936, he said, If civil liberties are suppressed, a nation loses all vitality and becomes important for anything substantial. The freedom of the press does not consist in our permitting such things as we like, to appear. How is that freedom? Even a tyrant is agreeable to this kind of freedom. Civil liberty and freedom of the press consist in our permitting what we do not like, in our putting up with criticisms of ourselves, in our allowing public expression of views which seem to us even to be injurious to our cause itself. That's why I said, look within, introspect. Do we match up to these standards of what is really civil liberties? Nehru attached as much importance to civil liberties as he did to economic equality and socialism. 
He drafted the Karachi resolution of the Indian National Congress, which I'm sure all of you know about. It was like the charter of the Congress. It was the precursor to the Constitution of India in 1931, which guaranteed freedom of expression and freedom of association. the enemy. Attack the system. We are fighting not against the British people, not even against the British officials. We are fighting against British imperialism. At the height of the Quit India Movement 1942, and I'm telling you this from personal example, we interviewed a lady who was then a young woman who later spent her whole life as a Gandhian. She was there in Bombay, where there was frenzy. There was a procession being taken out, and a British soldier was hurt because somebody threw something at this British soldier. The processionists stopped their procession, took the soldier to their home, treated him, gave him a glass of water, and he was astounded and said, what is this? They said, no, this is our nationalism. And I can tell you hundreds of stories of this kind, not one. In the, the, to the, the extent to which dialogue, and that is why I think our tradition in this country is so powerful and I'm not afraid that it can be easily snuffed out. See the response to you. See the response to JNU. Have you gone and mobilized? How much mobilization have you done? There is a spontaneous reform because this is inside people. People do not like civil liberties to be suppressed. They don't like democratic principles to be suppressed. They don't like an aggressive nationalism to be uh, flung at them as the genuine Indian nationalism. So this tradition is very deep, but we have to continue to fight for it. We can't be sanguine, but there's a lot of it there which will come to our aid if we have the courage to stand up. Gandhiji, at the height of, uh, you know, when he emerged as the leader of the national movement during the non-cooperation movement, you know, there were these revolutionaries who believe, whose, whose, whose politics in some ways was the exact opposite. They believed not just in violence, they believed in targeting individuals, you know, targeted terrorist violence, you know, bombs, shootings, etc. He called them for a dialogue. What are we saying in JNU? Dialogue with those who don't agree with us. Dialogue with those who are even going outside the pale of what we may think is correct or non-correct. Non no? He called them for a dialogue. They had long discussions, believe it or not. He said to them, I don't know whether my methods in the long run will prove to be the right ones or yours. But in order for me to experiment and try out my method of nonviolence, if at the same time violent incidents happen, my method will not get a chance to be really tried out. So I ask you, to suspend your politics for the period of this movement, the non-cooperation movement. Give me a chance to try my methods. If I fail, you take forward your methods. And would you believe it, they did? These were young people, completely believing in the opposite, and yet they agreed. So this was the level of dialogue that existed between opposing political strands within our freedom struggle, which is why we won the battle for freedom. Because people differed but worked together. Communists went in and out of the Indian national movement. Sometimes they had one theory, sometimes they had another. But they worked. They were in the peasant movements, they were in the workers' movement, they were in the women's movement, they were in the civil disobedience uh, uh, movements, the Satyagraha movements. And the politics which they uh, evolved was a politics in which their aim also was to bring the masses, the peasants and the workers into the freedom struggle. Of course, there were lots of differences. Nobody had perhaps greater differences than Nehru and Gandhi amongst themselves. Do please read Nehru's autobiography. Autobiography. 
Half the book is a criticism of Gandhi ji. Gandhi ji's reaction was, the more you criticize me, my love for you grows. What was poor Nehru to do with an opponent like that, who could disarm him always, who refused to get, you know, uh, annoyed or disturbed by anything he said and tried in fact to absorb and learn and continue to change. Tanika Sarkar the other day had talked here about Gandhiji. Perhaps my interpretation would be a little different, but I think the crucial point is that he was constantly evolving and changing in a radical direction. Absorbing from other strands, even at that late age. I'll end by saying, how many people could have the courage that Mahatma Gandhi showed what was ex exemplified in the last year before his assassination. He went to Noakhali on the 4th of November, 1946, when he heard that there was communal violence that had erupted over there. This was an area where there was a Muslim majority, a Hindu minority. The government in power was a hostile government. It was uh, a Muslim League uh, government. So he had, the people were not sympathetic. They were not uh, for him. The government was not for him. And yet he decided, if these are my people, and I'm saying this is my nation, I have to try and talk to them. I can't not talk to them. I can't just condemn them as communalists or whoever. So he went there and he stayed there for four months in one of the remotest districts of India. He didn't even come back to any town. He walked through village parts, dense jungle area, this Noakali. When people threw excreta in his path, he took off his sandals. His very rough wooden sandals which he used to wear. He says, do what you can. Torture me more. Crucify my flesh more. Something must be wrong with me that my people are behaving like this, that I cannot communicate with them. And after some time, people did start listening. Every evening he would have an open uh, prayer meeting, which he called prayer meeting, where anybody could come. We have examples of his prayer meetings in Bengal in 1946 in remote areas where two lakh people would turn up for his evening prayer meeting. This is in the days of communal, uh, you know, height of communal uh, antagonisms. And yet he insisted that dialogue must happen. On the 15th of August 1947, where was he? He was not in Delhi celebrating independence. But that is not because he was not proud of Indian independence. Some people interpret it like that. But he saw his task as being where the toughest situations were. Surawardi asked him to stay on in Calcutta. Because Surawardi feared that on 15th of August, Calcutta will go to India. And their government will come to an end. <coughs> and Hindus will take revenge for the Calcutta killings of August 1946. I need you, Gandhiji, to stay here with me. And Gandhiji said to Suravardi, I will, provided you and I sleep under the same roof. You stay with me, we'll stay together. On the 15th of August 1947, he walked in the streets of Calcutta hand in hand with his opponent, Suravardi. They had nothing in common. But he would dialogue, not only dialogue, do much more. That is the tradition which we have, we have, and which we have to fight for, to save, to keep up, and take forward. Thank you.